Okay, I'll resume the recording so we can get started. Uh, so I'd like to thank Bolton Bailey for being with us here to talk about his research. Uh, Bolton is um, a, a U of I uh, doctoral student and he's been researching uh, machine learning and recently moved into the blockchain space. And he has a really interesting paper and some research um, to share with us today. So I'll just go ahead and turn it right over to him so he can introduce himself and maybe tell us a little bit about uh, where his idea for this work came from and what he's working on. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so uh, the idea for here, let me share my screen. I have some slides. Um, so I guess the idea from this work, really, this is a work that sort of um, that sort of came out of reading a paper called Utrexo, and wondering sort of what could be done to uh, improve that paper. You know, there was there was actually a version of this sort of project that I think was much more heavily focused on machine learning, interestingly enough, but it sort of turned into something that was uh, sort of more related to to data structures. Uh, just because it, um, that turned out to be, in my mind, the sort of most efficient way to accomplish the thing that that we were trying to accomplish. Um, so really, uh, here, let me start the presentation. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk ab about today is um, validating Bitcoin transactions. Um, this is work uh, with my colleague, Surya. Um, and the, uh, let's see, yeah, okay, great. So the, the, main, um, the main topic of my talk today is, uh, is stateless nodes. So if you, um, if you know about Bitcoin, you probably know, I, I've tried to pitch this to as broad as audiences as, as possible. So um, anyone should feel free to, to you know, stop me and ask questions. Uh, in the middle of the talk if they feel like they want me to answer a question. So uh, you probably hopefully know what a what a full node is. Uh, if, if you're just familiar with the very basics of sort of Bitcoin, you know what a full node is. It's a node that is sort of very, uh, does all of the Bitcoin processing. And then a light node is something in Bitcoin that does sort of less processing. And a stateless node uh, is something that does a little bit of uh, of both. Um, it has some of it does a lot of verification, but it also um, doesn't use as much resources as a full node does. And so, stateless clients and statelessness is sort of a very interesting um, and exciting direction for for blockchains to go in. There's a lot of research being done on statelessness both in Bitcoin and Ethereum, and perhaps other blockchains as well. Um, so in this talk, I'll, I guess I'll outline sort of the background for, for how stateless nodes work. And then I'm going to talk about my own research, which is sort of about taking advantage of patterns in how people spend Bitcoin uh, to make stateless nodes perform better. Um, so a full node in Bitcoin is a node that uh, downloads, stores, verifies, and forwards every block and transaction that's made on the blockchain. Um, and it's, uh, it's sort of the backbone of the Bitcoin network uh, in that every sort of full node that's, that's run out there supports the network in that it, it forwards this information and make sure that everyone who wants to participate in Bitcoin can, uh, but they're also computationally expensive, uh, you know, both from sort of the network bandwidth perspective and also from the, um, from the, just from the perspective of how much data such a node is required to store. So here are some charts, right? Uh, and it, they show that basically these days uh, it's, uh, it's 300, uh, gigabytes of of size just to run to run a complete full node that has all of the blocks stored in its memory. That's like 300 gigabytes at this point. Um, and even if you 
do what's called pruning of the blockchain, where you only save uh, the transactions that you need to save to verify future uh, blocks, uh, that's still several gigabytes. I was doing some napkin math and it seems like it's about 17 gigabytes to, um, to save all that data. So that's, um, you know, that's something that you might say is a bit, a, a bit of bad news for someone who is interested in, in running a node because uh, it starts to get to the point where you need a rather powerful or a, at least a computer with, with big memory in order to actually run one of these things. Um, so the sort of solution, the sort of classic solution from the Bitcoin white paper is, uh, is to use a light node, right? So a light node is something that only downloads the block headers and checks the proof of work in those headers. Uh, of the Bitcoin blockchain. Just, just making sure, does everyone know what a block header is? I, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Can I, can I get some, some confirmation? Are, do people, I mean, I, I, I wanna make sure that I'm not like pitching my talk to, uh, to, high, to high an audience or maybe is anyone, is anyone there? Hello? Maybe just give a couple sentence definition and then uh, and then we can. Okay, go on. sure. So um, let me see. What is a block header? So um, blocks in Bitcoin, you know, they consist of uh, of a, a bunch of transactions, right? Of Bitcoin transactions that um, that are people sending Bitcoin from one person to another. And uh, the way that these transactions are um, tabulated is they're all put into a block. And then what Bitcoin miners do is they will try and uh, compute uh, hashes. So they'll, they'll, do, they'll solve a computational puzzle, which uh, allows uh, people who look at the block to see that a large amount of computation has been spent uh, in order to make that block, right? Uh, and so what a light node does is they verify the part of the blockchain, which, which makes sure that a lot of work has been done to make sure that the block um, a lot of work has been done to create the block. They make sure lots of work has been done to create all the blocks. And that gives them some degree of certainty that, um, that the, the transactions are actually correct and they're, they're honest transactions from people who have actually signed, um, provided signatures that they own the, the Bitcoin that they actually own. Uh, but uh, what a person who is running a light node does not do is to check that the transactions that are contained inside a block actually, um, they don't check that the, the transactions that are contained inside a block are actually transactions that, are, um, that haven't say been spent twice. Right. So I think a good way to put it is it's like if an auditor was checking your company's books, they can say from month to month, we see that you have honest accounting um, from one month to another. It's like you have the same beginning balance and ending balance, but within each month, a light node isn't checking to see that all the transactions within the month aren't cheating, so to speak. Right. Yeah, sure. You can think of the blockchain. I, th I think it, there's sort of a metaphor of the blockchain is sort of like a um, uh, sort of like a, a ledger, right? And you have to make sure that every sort of entry in that ledger is, you know, you've done the correct math to make sure that the total is correct. And if there's an error in the ledger, what what nodes are supposed to do, is they're supposed to reject that and say, no, that's not correct. Uh, I'm going to ignore that completely. But the only way for 
blocks to know to ignore those those or sorry, the only way for nodes to know how to ignore those bad blocks is for them to actually check the that the addition is correct in each of those individual transactions. And that's something that a light node would not do. They would just sort of trust other blocks in the network to, to do that sort of verification for them. And so it sort of poses a something of a risk because if two nodes, too many nodes stop doing these checks and it turns out that there are blocks that actually are incorrect, uh, light nodes might think that those blocks are good blocks when they're, when they're bad. And they might think that someone had gin, given them Bitcoin when they actually didn't receive any Bitcoin and they might make a bad decision. So for that reason, it's important that or I guess most people would say that it's important on some level for as many blocks or as many nodes as possible should be doing these checks to make sure that uh, everything is above board. And so that's what, uh, that is the, the drawback of, a, of running a light node as opposed to a full node. Okay, so now we talk about uh, stateless nodes, right? A stateless node uh, is, is basically a solution to this problem of how do we compromise between security of checking every single block is correct and uh, the big memory requirements of sort of remembering everything that exists in the blockchain, right? So it's, a, it's an idea that's been around really since 2010 in various forms, but it was never actually realized. I think it, perhaps one of, the one of the reasons it was never realized in Bitcoin was because for a long time, people thought it would sort of require a hard fork of the Bitcoin protocol to even uh, introduce the possibility for stateless nodes. Right, so a, a, fork, a, a fork of a blockchain happens when two people dis or two groups of miners disagree over how exactly the protocol should work. And this is how you think you get things like Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash or whatever. Um, and I guess that, you know, cryptocurrencies in general try to av avoid hard forks like this because they sort of want to be just one single currency, right? Um, and so for that reason, they try to avoid, they, they sort of avoided introducing stateless nodes into the Bitcoin protocol by default. But it, the sort of concept was revived recently when it was sort of pointed out that it's actually unnecessary to, to do a hard fork of the protocol or of the blockchain to implement stateless nodes. It turns out that you can run stateless nodes uh, without even needing to, you know, touch the main Bitcoin code. There's a way of sort of, of having a sort of secondary network on top of the Bitcoin network that allows you to, to do stateless nodes. Um, and it's also of interest to the Ethereum community who, who are also interested in sort of uh, their F, 1.x initiative to upgrade the proof of work Ethereum main chain and and sort of uh, get it to a point where these uh, stateless proofs and stuff like that can can be a part of it. So how to describe how a stateless node actually works, right? How do we get this um, this state of affairs where we're both checking all of the math in the blockchain ledger, right? And at the same time, we want to make sure that we're not actually using up too much disk space on our computer, right? We're not using 300 gigabytes or 17 gigabytes of disk space just to run a, a Bitcoin node. So 
what's the essential issue in in check doing the math to check the ledger, right? So the the real thing that you have to make sure is that um, the unspent transaction outputs that are spent in a particular block uh, are all real transaction outputs. So what is what is an unspent trans transaction output? So every Bitcoin that exists uh, today is in the form of an unspent transaction output. So a Bitcoin transaction happens when someone who has a Bitcoin uh, takes that Bitcoin and makes a, a digital signature to send that Bitcoin to someone else. And that process is called a transaction. And what happens is there are inputs to that transaction and there are outputs to that transaction. There are people who provide money to the transaction and then when the transaction completes, new people get that money, right? And the, the outputs are sort of the units of Bitcoin that are put out of these transactions for the next person who owns the Bitcoin to, to have. And so basically the, the entire Bitcoin blockchain revolves around preserving the sort of state of every uh, UTXO in existence, right? You know, Alice has one Bitcoin, Bob has two Bitcoins, Charlie has 0.5 Bitcoins, right? So everyone has a certain amount of Bitcoin and that set of sort of who has the Bitcoin and how much is the state of the whole blockchain. And the real key is, is, is that because, you know, so many people have used Bitcoin for so long, uh, that list is a very long list and it's multiple gigabytes long. And we want to avoid people holding that list, right? So how do you make it so that a node doesn't have to hold every or hold in their hard disk that list of every person, every you know, public key and how much Bitcoin is associated with that public key. And the idea is we're gonna use a, a, what's called a cryptographic accumulator. Um, you can sort of think of it as a Merkle tree, which I will sort of explain a little bit. Uh, a cryptographic accumulator is basically this piece of cryptography that allows you to know uh, it, it allows you to just hold, you know, a short string of 32 bytes. And that string of bytes represents in some special way, the entire set, the entire list of all the, of all the public key uh, to, to Bitcoin mappings, right? It, it lists the, it represents the entire state of the, of the blockchain. And the special thing about it is that someone can quickly prove to you, if you have the, these 32 bytes, they can prove to you that any particular uh, value is, is either present in the state uh, or yeah, or I guess in some cases it can also prove that it's not present. But what you really need to be able to do is prove that a particular thing is present in the state because if I have, say, you know, two Bitcoin and I want to send it to someone, I need to be able to prove that I have those two Bitcoin. For for someone, someone who's going to check the blockchain later needs to needs to see a proof somehow that I had that that I had that um, that money before I sent it, right? And so the stateless nodes are really about these sort of proofs. And so I've included a figure here from the Utrexo paper to sort of show how this works on a sort of network level of, of nodes sending you know, data to each other. So the stateless nodes need these proofs of, of things in order to, to function correctly. And what happens is there are going to be these altruistic nodes that are termed bridge nodes they send out these proofs and these stateless nodes here, they're, they're, uh, they're called compact state nodes. Uh, the stateless nodes will sort of propagate them, the proofs amongst themselves. Um, and 
in that way, all of the compact state nodes or all of the stateless nodes will eventually get all of the proofs they need to, to verify that everything uh, present in the blockchain is, is actually present. How do we uh, verify the trustworthiness of the bridge node? Well, that's a, that's a good question. So really you only need one trustworthy bridge node to exist for the, for the system to work. Uh, but the reason that you don't, so, so how do you verify the trustworthiness of the, of the bridge node? So the bridge node sends proofs and the, the key thing to realize, I guess I'll go back a slide is that, um, so the bridge node sends a proof and there's a, there is a algorithm for the stateless node to be able to check that the proof is correct. So uh, that I'll go into the details of the algorithm in just a minute, but basically the, the, the bridge node could totally be dishonest and they could be sending proofs that don't really mean anything. But when the, the stateless nodes go to check those proofs, they will see that the proofs don't actually make any sense. Right. Okay. And yeah, and they'll realize that that whoever was sending those proofs is sort of a, a you know a bad node, and they'll probably stop uh, accepting. They'll probably close their connection with that node. So. Uh, yeah, so only one bridge node really needs to exist for the whole system to work. We just need some way of propagating these proofs to everyone. And the point is that, you know, even if every bridge node in the world fails at the same time, it's still not too much of a problem because what will just happen is the stateless nodes will um, stop accepting new blocks for a little bit. And, uh, and they won't do anything crazy like accepting a block that's invalid. Okay, so it's all about these proofs and it's all sort of about the design of these cryptographic accumulators, right? How, what is, what is the data that you prove something against? What does the proof look like? So now I'm going to talk about sort of Merkle trees, Utrexo, red black trees, and a variety of, of ways that you can use a hash function to uh, to produce to 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 create these accumulators and and create these proofs of things. So I guess I should um, perhaps I'll, okay. So perhaps I'll just go to the next slide and give a sort of uh, top level explanation of of a Merkle tree and um, what a cryptographic hash function is. Okay, so if you've, if you've read the Bitcoin white paper, uh, you, you know what a Merkle tree is, but I'll, I'll give an, an explanation of it, of it here. So here we have a tree and these, uh, these little circles with UTXO at the bottom, that's all of the data that we want to be able to verify, right? So you can think of each of these circles as a separate piece of data representing someone's Bitcoin, right? And what we need to be able to do is verify that a particular person's uh, data is, is in the blockchain. And what this picture represents is a data structure where every, um, every piece of data has been put through what's known as a cryptographic hash function. So a cryptographic hash function, the real, uh, the real crux of that is that it's impossible to reverse such a function and it's impossible to have to, it's really sort of impossible or impractical to find two things which hash to the same thing. So it's just a function. And basically every time you evaluate this function on a new input, the output that you get is basically totally random. 
it's really impossible to tell uh, what the next thing will be the next time you evaluate it on something you haven't evaluated before. So the what we have here is sort of a way that you might prove it, that a particular transaction is included in the set of all transactions here. So what we have is uh, a particular transaction sits here at the bottom. And there's some sequence of, of hexadecimal data associated with that transaction, 741D. Now, 741D is then combined with the, the neighbor data here, which is 9568. And it's combined into the next level node, which is 7327. And then that sort of continues up the tree. We have these hashes, right? They're, they're combined in, with the sort of hash function and we combine them all the way up the tree to the root. And the way that we would prove that this bottom transaction uh, is really included in everything under the root is we would go and we would check that um all of the hash functions here uh sort of combined their way and and all of these values were correct so what we would do is we would check that if we took 741d and 9568 and combined and sort of concatenated them and took their hash that that would result in 7327 and we would check that c564 when combined with 7327 and hash would give B6, BC26, and so on all the way up. And what that would do is it would provide a proof. Uh, just a second, sorry. That would sort of provide a proof that this piece of data 741D at the bottom was one of the many uh, pieces of data that was sort of a leaf of this tree, that it was sort of here at the bottom of the tree. Because, you know, if 741D wasn't at the bottom of the tree, you know, there would be no way of combining it with anything to get something at this, this penultimate level of the tree. And if, it, if there weren't anything at the penultimate level of the tree, there would be no way of getting anything at this level of the tree and so on. There would sort of be no way of including this, um, this thing at the very bottom uh, if without there, being, without there being a sort of pathway all the way down to it in terms of this hash function. Uh, I guess I'll stop here for, for questions because I sort of am beginning to, I, I might doubt that like uh, this is the, the best possible explanation, but I wanna give people the opportunity to ask questions about it. Okay, uh, so if there are, there are no real questions, I'll sort of go on to try and describe the um, the the prospects for using this sort of Merkle tree as the proof mechanism that uh, a stateless node needs to verify that a particular. Uh, node is is either present or not present in the blockchain right so one thing that needs to be possible is it needs to be possible to delete something from this tree um when someone spends their bitcoin right so if if this if this utxo here represents uh alice has three bitcoins and then alice you know, sends those three Bitcoins to Bob, it's gonna be necessary to delete everything from this branch of the tree. 
right? So how can we how can we go back and create a new tree um, once this has been done, right? How can we create a new tree that doesn't have a particular that doesn't have this seven four one D in it when we want to delete it, right? So I think this is like the the real um, this is this is described in this sort of Utrexo paper that that I said that this work was sort of inspired by. Uh, they provided a way, or or Dreisha provided a way, in which you can sort of do this deletion. So the basic idea is you think of a of what's a forest of perfect binary trees. So basically you can see that each of the trees in this group is sort of perfectly balanced. Here we have a tree of, of eight, right? So on this side, there are four, um, um, there are four leaves over here. And on this side, there are four leaves. And this is sort of a smaller tree that only has two leaves, right? So it's, it's a bunch of sort of binary trees. And how do you delete something? Well, what you do is you just remove that entire branch and you then reorder all of the remaining trees sort of from largest to shortest. And now that you've reordered them, what you can do is you can sort of fill in the remaining nodes. So basically I had, I had, uh, sorry, I had these two nodes and I just computed the hash that sort of is supposed to go above those two nodes. And then now that I had this new node 35C1, I combined that with 5597 to get this sort of new top level node B6A6. And what this does is it provides a way of deleting something from the leaves of the tree. And basically this gives you a new Merkle tree, or I guess in this case, a collection of Merkle trees, sort of, uh, sort of the same thing in some ways. Um, but once you have this sort of collection of Merkle trees, then it's um, it's sort of easy to make new proofs for new pieces of data. Like now, if I wanted to make a proof for A six three two, I would just include this whole sort of branch of the tree. Going up from going up to one three b seven all the way to b six a six, and so this is basically the the solution that's proposed in the Utrexo sort of project. Uh, and just to sort of continue with the explanation, another thing that we need to be able to do is add new pieces of data to this set. So let's say that there are two new UTXOs that are being added. I don't know, maybe some minor mind to block or someone split their split their coin into two pieces and gave it to two friends. You know, that's possible to do in Bitcoin. So to add these new things, you just sort of put them on the right here and you do the sort of same thing. You propagate all the way up, you know, you make these pieces of the data, you compute these hashes. Uh, and you get to the point where you, at the top level you have um, you have a hash. And basically you get to the point where you have a collection of, of balanced trees. And the idea is that just using these sort of top level nodes, this B6, A6 node and D7AE node in this case, you can sort of prove that everything below them is in the tree. And this, you know, sort of provides the proof that stateless nodes need to, to verify that particular thing is in the blockchain or it's not in the blockchain. And sort of the question is, you know, what is the size, right? The whole point is that we were using gigabytes before, but now we're only going to have to keep track of, you know, basically this one string B6A6 and this one string D7AE. And, you know, of course, the real Bitcoin blockchain has more than 12 UTXOs in it. But the point is that 
it's really only going to be at most the log base two of the total number of UTXOs. And you know, the log base two of, of many numbers is quite small. So, so it's, this turns out to not be too much, um, too much of a, of a storage requirement just to store these sort of top level nodes. You don't actually have to use much memory to do it. And it makes your node much more efficient to do so. All right. So another question is, you know, how much data is actually required to prove that a particular UTXO is present? So here I have two or three uh, UTXOs in purple that I want to prove that they're present, right? Just to make sure, hopefully, that we're all on the same page. We do need to prove things, right? We need to prove that these UTXOs are here. So what data is required to make those proofs? Well, if we're going to prove that this particular purple thing is in the tree, right? We're going to need to verify that everything above it is in the tree. And because this A1, B1, for example, is computed out of the hash of these two things below it, it's the hash of F7BB06A6. We are also going to need 06A6. Um, we're going to need to send that data in our proof because we're going to need to check, right, that as, as, a, as a stateless node, stateless nodes will need to check that F7BB06A6 hashes to A1B1. And so these orange nodes all need to be part of the proof. And I guess the moral of the story is that you know, the height of the tallest tree times the number of, of bottom level uh, values you need to prove uh, times the length of each of these, um, the length of each of these bit strings, which I guess is 32 bytes, right? That's gonna be the total proof size. So in this case, um, I guess it's it's either going to be is I, this is going to be this or less, right? It, it could be less because you could sort of have proofs which are in a tree that only has two elements that are much shorter. But by and large, right, here we have, you know, the height of the tree is four. And, you know, here's a list of four things that need to be in the proof. Here's a list of four things that need to be in the proof. Here's a list of only th three things that need to be in this proof. So it's actually a little bit less than four but sort of a rough guide for how much data it's gonna take in total is um, given sort of by the number of proofs times the height of the trees. So um, I thought this was a very interesting approach. I thought it was very cool. I, I don't think at that point in my life that I first read this, I had ever, thought too much about how you could make a Merkle tree that you know you could change from from block to block and add things and delete things sort of a, it's what's called a dynamic accumulator right um, and I was sort of thinking how could one improve on this and and how could you actually make the proof size shorter because you know, I guess the one drawback of running a stateless node is that these proofs are sort of data that needs to be sent to you. So you'll, you'll sort of run up your phone bill or your internet bill if you're sending too much of this data over the internet and you would like to send as little data as possible. So what can be done to make the proof sizes shorter in particular, if we stop thinking about just binary trees and think about other ways of maybe organizing these trees, how can we sort of improve things? And also, to what extent can, can we take advantage of sort of the spending patterns of users to make a system that's more efficient? And I'll sort of describe what that means. So, it's an interesting fact 
that I think, you know, is, is sort of interesting and a completely independent, completely independently of these talk, that the amount of time that one, that a Bitcoin spends in the blockchain before it's spent follows a very particular distribution uh, that's sometimes known as a Pareto distribution, or at least it seems to follow a Pareto distribution. So if you take a look at this plot, this plot's also from, from the UtreXO paper, by the way. Uh, what this shows is the number of transactions that spend, um, that's, that are spent 10 blocks after being created, that are spent 100 blocks after being created, that are spent 1,000 blocks after being created. And the, um, the thing that you notice from this plot is that it seems like about 10 times more, uh, you'll notice this is actually a log log plot. So, so up here at the top, you can see that the number of, the number of UTXOs that spend one block before they're spent, right? That's 10 to the zero is one. So it's about 10 to the eight uh, transactions that's, that spend one block in the blockchain before being spent. So, you know, just from, what does that mean? It means that like the most, the most common thing in the blockchain, funnily enough, is for someone to submit a transaction and then that transaction is immediately spent by someone else, right? It's, it's sort of funny to think that people like every 10 minutes, every time a, a block is, is set, you know, there's just these transactions that are being sent and then sent again and then sent again. But the fact of the matter is uh, most people are, are spending their transactions pretty quickly. Now, maybe they're not actually people, maybe it, it's because these are sort of, you know, big, uh, maybe these are Coinbase or sort of cryptocurrency service providers who, who manage many, many Bitcoins all at the same time. And they're, they've, they've constantly got things moving and that's the reason. But the sort of moral of the story is that, you know, most Bitcoins are sort of spent very quickly, you know, it's, you know, Bitcoins that spend, a hundred blocks in the blockchain are ten times more common as 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 ones that spend a thousand blocks in the blockchain, right? And another thing that you can see from from looking carefully at this graph is that the longer a Bitcoin has existed, the longer it takes to eventually be spent, right? That's sort of an interesting thing, but it sort of it sort of makes sense, right? Because you know. If there's a Bitcoin that's been around five minutes, and then there's a Bitcoin that's been around five years, it's like, which one would you expect to be spent sooner? Well, you know, maybe the one that's been around five years, you know, is never going to be spent at all. Maybe whoever, whoever owns that Bitcoin has actually just forgotten their, their keys and, and that Bitcoin is lost forever, right? So it's definitely the case that, that you know, the more recent a Bitcoin transaction is, the higher the probability is that it'll be spent re the, that'll be spent again soon. And this was something that was pointed out in the Utrexo paper. Um, but it definitely points out to something that we can really do to optimize the tree structure that we use. Right? We would like our proofs to overlap as much as possible, right? So contrast this picture where three transactions are being spent to the one that we saw a few slides ago where three other transactions were being spent, right? In the, in the earlier one, those, uh, I'll, I'll go back, right? So in this picture, we have, we, we're trying to prove something about three uh, transactions in sort of different parts of the tree. And we have to make sort of three separate proofs. But in, um, in, this, in this tree, where the, the three things that we're proving are very close together, actually the proofs sort of overlap, right? 
So we had zero B, one D, nine E, eight D, D, seven, eight E, right? But it turns out that D, seven, eight E is sort of, is sort of a part of a proof of each of these three transactions, right? So, so each of A, B, B, seven, B, one, C, four, right? Each of these is going to need D, seven, eight E as a part of their, their proof to prove that they're in the blockchain. And it's actually very good that these transactions are so close together because it means that we, do, because we don't have to send this number D78E more than once, right? We send it once and that's enough to prove that all, to be part of the proof that all of these things below it are in the, are in the blockchain. So basically, you know, at first I was thinking, oh, perhaps we can do some machine learning to make sure that, that things are, are always staying in the same place. But it turns out that because, you know, the recent transactions are the most likely to be spent, the, the sort of thing you want to do is keep the UTXOs in the order that they were introduced to the chain as much as possible, right? And if you do that, then you'll actually sort of save on the proof size. So what you want is a tree structure where all of the sort of leaves of the tree are sort of in the order and they, they don't change their order. Basically, you, you, don't, you don't ever do this sort of permutation thing where you, you exchange um, one part of the tree for another and the trees, the, the transactions get out of order. So, what we want to do is build an order respecting Merkle tree. Um, the time distribution, I said, is Pareto distributed. Uh, but we also, another important thing, as you can see with this sort of example, is we also want the tree to be balanced, right? We don't want just a tree that ha has one huge branch off to the left or one huge branch off to the right. We want the height of the tree to be logarithmic and the number of nodes, which basically means we want the tree to sort of be balanced. Um, and there are a few data structures that sort of achieve this. Uh, one thing to realize is that we sort of are, are going to be Merkleizing instead of just binary trees, we're going to be Merkleizing sort of more complicated data structures now. For example, red black trees is one approach that you could take to this. Um, this is sort of one of those things that, that come up in an algorithms class and then usually you never see them again. But in this case, they actually are helpful because it's a, it's a data structure that's specifically designed to keep things in order, right? So here's how a red black tree works. It's sort of a, this trick where each of these nodes is colored either red or black. The UTXOs are all black. They, there's a certain set of rules we have to abide by when making a red black tree. The UTXOs are all black. The children of red nodes are black. And each branch has the same number of black uh, nodes along the branch. So you can see here, uh, this, this rightmost branch has four black nodes going down. And you can check that every other branch has exactly four black nodes as well. So because each branch has the same number of black nodes, that means that the tree has to be roughly balanced, right? Because you know, if there has to be some number of black nodes on this side and some number of black nodes on this side, you can't have too many red nodes because a red node can never be the child of another red node. Basically all of these rules, but the sort of point of them is it's possible to still do this adding and deleting operation while following the rules and keeping everything in order. You know, it, it actually turns out that it, I'm not going to sort of justify why it's possible to do the add and delete. So it turns out that there's very complicated thing. It's sort of, you, you have to sometimes rotate the tree around to sort of fix it when, when you do these um, add and delete operations. But this is just one way that you can sort of construct this tree in an ordered way. Um, it's the the red black tree is is balanced, but it's not quite balanced, right? It, it's still possible. I, I'll go back. It's still possible to sort of have one side be less, be shorter than the other a little bit in some ways, right? 
So it's not a perfectly balanced tree. It's just sort of balanced enough to make sure that it's not going to be too bad. But um, we sort of tested it out. And in practice, it seemed like this red black tree was not really the most e efficient version. The version we ended up with was, um, was sort of a variant of what is used in the Ethereum blockchain, which is a try. Um, so that's a data structure that has indices and each node uh, sort of has a, a set of indices below it. The height of the tree is logarithmic and the total number of historical transactions, but it's sort of simpler uh, and preferable to red black trees. So here's sort of what a tree looks like. Basically each of these nodes at the bottom has a particular number associated with it in addition to a hash. Um, and I, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna tr sort of just try and give a top level explanation of all this, right? Each of these nodes now is sort of responsible for this range. Like this node is, is responsible for the range one zero 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 through one 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 one. Uh, to delete these two nodes, we sort of go up the tree and we delete the particular nodes and we make sure to connect nodes um, to their to the parent of their parent when their parent is deleted, right? So you can have sort of connections that that stretch between levels. And it's also, uh, we, we have to create new hashes for these nodes, right? So all those green things are gonna be new hashes. And we, we can also add things to the tree sort of in a similar way. We build up this tree and we make sure we connect everything properly. And you know, because the sort of order of these nodes never changes, the the order of the UTXOs will or the order of the UTXOs will be sort of preserved in this um, scheme. So we implemented an approach to this in Go, and we were sort of comparing ourselves with the UTXO since that seems to be the like the big way that this is being approached in Bitcoin now. Um, so our approach does use a few fewer gigabytes over, so we, we've been, in fact, I'm running code now to sort of test this. So far we've gotten to like 500,000 blocks and it seems like we're using, you know, fewer gigabytes than the other approach uses, but there are a few caveats to this. Um, one caveat is that this doesn't actually count the sort of things that need to be downloaded by default anyway, right? So in addition to all this proof data, you also need to download actual blockchain data, right? You actually need to download, you know, headers and the details of these transactions and stuff. So that's sort of stuff that you can't avoid downloading, but, you know, if you were to like add that on, this, this ratio might be something more like four to five rather than, you know, like one to four which sort of, you know, it's sort of like, if you have to download that anyway, then it's not technically that big of an improvement. I guess it sort of depends on how you look at it. And another thing is that sort of our code is, is sort of slower, much slower in fact, than the, the UTXO code um, because it, uh, I guess it's just sort of a more complicated algorithm. You have to manipulate these indices and store things and retrieve things from storage. Uh, so yeah, that's basically all of my talk. Just to conclude, I think that there are some like bigger ideas that you might uh, sort of go forward with this. For example, Ethereum uses tries it in their account storage system, but it indexes based on hash. There are sort of interesting things that I think you know would happen if if Ethereum were to index purely on location. It would make some things more complicated and some like attack vectors might become easier, but it would also sort of, I think there would also be a lot of like efficiency benefits. And I sort of wonder what would happen if, if those efficiency benefits were uh, like, like perhaps, you know, perhaps that's something that people might be willing ex to accept in the name of sort of greater efficiency and greater throughput on the blockchain. Anyway, so that's my entire talk. So thank you all for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, and I'm happy to like answer questions or. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let's open up for five, 10 minutes of questions. If anybody has 
anything they'd like to know. Um, so I would like uh, to ask a question. Yeah. Um, so what are the original designs before this? You, sorry, this you're Calvin version? Kim. Are you, you're, you're, I see your name is, is Calvin Kim. I, I think that's the name of one of the sort of Utrexo developers. Yes, I work on Utrexo. Okay, cool. Um, so one of the earlier sort of versions of Utrexo before the, the current algorithm today was this, um, it, it was a very similar one where, uh, when you delete a node, you don't uh, swap another one in, but uh, you just leave that one empty. And Taj eventually said that uh, he ditched that idea because once you have enough of these uh, empty positions, then once the tree grows bigger, that affects the security of aspect of the tree. So I'm just curious if you guys have uh, considered um, the, the security effect that this has on the tree. Right. Okay. So that's an interesting question. Um, the security effect that it has on the tree. Um, so, so, so I guess there's a few things, right? So one thing is, I guess that this, the, the approach with the, the try is slightly different than, than just sort of deleting a node and not replacing it because there's also an additional change to this sort of um, structure here. Let me go back a little bit, right? So, so, so one thing that 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 changes is when we do this deletion. You can see node zero 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 dash zero 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 one now connects to the zero 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 dash zero one one one, right? Which is something that would that is sort of slightly different than just doing the deletion without replacement, because because this zero 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 dash zero zero one one node is actually deleted, and we have to connect this sort of node to its grandparent. Um, so, I guess so. That's that's one aspect. I guess the the tree is taller than it than it theoretically has to be because you can have as many as log number of um, log of the number of total transactions ever, as opposed to just log of unspent transactions. It, it, like in terms of security, it seems like as long as you have sort of a, any sort of hash tree structure, then it's going to be secure because it's never going to be possible to prove that a particular hash that's not in the tree it is not in the tree or it's never going to be possible to prove that a hash that's not in the tree is in the tree so i'm not i'm not sure how the how the security would be affected by by one approach approach or another okay thank you Guys, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. This is Sebastian. Uh, hold on, let me turn on my camera. Here you are. Um, I'm very new to cryptocurrency and um, a lot of these details will probably skip, fly over my head, but um, I had a question, let me know if it makes sense or not. Uh, does the history of the tree has any value? Meaning uh, once you have deleted a node and replaced uh, and worked out the tree, does the history of the previous instance of the tree has any value? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, yes, I, I I would say that there there is sort of some value because, or it it's it's not necessarily valuable to the person who has already seen that history, and now it's it's sort of in their their past. But if there's a, a new person who wants to come and start their own node and do the verification, someone is going to need to give them the history so that they can check for themselves that the entire history is correct. So it, it definitely, I think that there's definitely an ethos of 
of there should definitely it's it's considered a good thing to sort of store all of the history so that when a person comes they can check the history for themselves um it's just there's nothing really to incentivize it i guess perhaps there's something on that sort of network level of um, I mean, no one's going to, to sort of pay you to store the history, but, but a lot of people do it anyway, I think, because they sort of want to contribute to the health of the Bitcoin network. So that will imply that if I were to start a new node, I will have to go back to the, to the full ledger and try to start a tree of validations like this one, right? I cannot start from a specific point in time on the ledger. And um, I guess the reason why I'm asking this is because um, I, I was trying to get whether the history of the tree make any value in terms of establishing security across the neighbor and stuff like that. And like you said, it's pretty, pretty useful, it seems to me, uh, that it will do something like um, Datomic, the database based on closure does. So in, instead of deleting, you're changing the branches of the tree and you have new pointers to every specific mutation of the tree. So basically you keep evolving the tree over time and you, what you have is changes in the branches and the pointers. You, you actually don't delete anything. So um, uh, yes, instead of having one snapshot of what was the last status of uh, status of, the, of, of this Merkle tree, you have a history of evolution and you can go back and forth in all the mutations and rewind for for lack of a better word to to actually look at okay this was true because i can follow the sequence of events is that right. something that um right that's that's a good point so like here i can toggle right i can toggle between these two things before and after i delete but you can see like in in these two things many of the things re remain exactly the same, right? So basically this whole, the whole right side of this tree remains the same. And so I guess, you know, you know, you can be, to be very efficient about it, if you want to store every sort of version of the tree, um, you can, you know, it, it might be valuable, for example, if there's sort of a, a fork, right? And you want to rewind to a particular point in the tree to, to continue it on, on a different sort of branch of the blockchain, right? It might be valuable to sort of rewind. And basically you, you could think about a system where you store all of the nodes in the tree in one big database. Um, How does and, that compare to the, the whole ledger itself? Because uh, if we save all snapshots of the tree, yes, we do have a bunch of data, but if we only change state, at every um, mutation of the tree, we're reducing the size by many orders of magnitude because we only right. save what's being changed. And we can always go back in history to know what has changed prior to that last event. Does that make right. any sense? Yeah, that makes, uh, that makes sense, right? So to store, I think to store every version of the tree at, at every point in time is going to require at least this in terms of storage requirements, I guess, is that what you're asking? Like what would be their storage requirements to, to store all of that? To well, store every compare, version. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, to store every version of the tree at all points in time would take um, more gigabytes than sort of the entire Bitcoin blockchain anyway. So that would be, you know, probably hundreds of gigabytes. Um, in order to just store the, um, if you were just going to store the most recent version of the tree, then then that would be, you know, probably a few times more than the the total number of of unspent. So so, I think that would wind up being something like fifty or so gigabytes. Um, so 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 yeah. So so, I guess it's worth stressing that. The, the maintaining this entire tree is something that only the, the bridge nodes do. And the bridge nodes are, are sort of these, these big nodes 
that that you know really only one person has to run them um and presumably it's someone with a lot of or hopefully it's someone with the very expensive hardware who can do that thank you yeah okay thanks So out of curiosity with the, some of the improvements you're recommending, um, do you still see a place for light nodes or will we move to something a little more um, robust? Um, I, guess, I, I guess you could still make the case for, for, for light nodes. For example, you know, I mean, um, Right. So, so this, I mean, this this scheme is still going to require more bandwidth than a light node would use, and perhaps you know there there are there are nodes who just don't have any capability of using much bandwidth at all, and they don't have many, they don't have much storage at all, and so that would be, you know, that might still be a reason to to run a light node. Um, sure. Okay. I'll do uh, one last call for questions and then we can uh, wrap it up because I know we are over time and people might have to get back to other things. Uh, I would like to ask something that's related but not quite on this specific topic um, since it's my first time in the meetup. Um, I just wanted to try to get a little more familiar with the meeting. Um, do you guys have, in general, it's just up for everybody, have any uh, particular practical implementation on exchange? Uh, I think, uh, Adam, you mentioned that you were related to something, didn't you? Uh, was Adam or, or Todd? What do you mean? Sorry. Uh, in terms of like real world implementation, either participation in an exchange that is actively trading or in any oh. sort of solutions like payment solutions, any other utilization of the blockchain technology in, in current uh, industry. Today. As, as, a, as a meetup group, we don't. As a meetup group, we, this is purely an interest group. Uh, we just hear from uh, all sorts of people, uh, both within the uh, Champaign-Urbana community and beyond um, to sort of hear what's going on and discuss um, items around blockchain. Um, one of our co-organizers, co uh, Todd Courtney, is involved with a with Jump Trading. Uh, he works for Jump Trading, which does uh, work with exchanges. So uh, that was something we discussed at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so maybe we'll have to have him give us some more information about that in the future if uh, you want to hear more. Yeah, I would love to hear that. And, and if there's somebody that has a little bit of expertise on the legal side of things, it will be very interesting as well to hear about uh, the implications and regulations around um, the technology. Awesome. Well, we will put um, legal aspects on our list of uh, potential future topics as, as well as exchanges um, and uh, the kind of technology that goes into um, that. Um, if anybody has other ideas for future topics from, uh, for us to discuss and have presentations on, uh, go ahead and go into the meetup group and send me a message. And I would love to collect those uh, so we know what you guys want to hear about. Um, but other than that, um, I think it's been a, a great time. Bolton, I'd like to thank you again uh, for an excellent talk. It was really great to hear about your research and uh, consider these ideas. Um, yeah, thanks. And uh, do you have any, uh, uh, I think, um, do you have any contact information where we could get a hold of you or they, places where people can go to see more of what you're doing? Uh, let's see. I mean, uh, you can talk, you can probably contact through me through my um, university email, boltonb2 at uh, illinois.edu. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. You could you could follow my Google Scholar page. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Go go to find me. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, Todd, any parting words before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you all 
uh, next month. Hope you all have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a wonderful New Year. Happy Holidays. <laughs>